Good morning, this is Justin Hitt, and we're going to show you how to get more leads and customers from your business website right now. With coronavirus, I promise to offer a few free programs to help you get started earning more money and growing your business. I know it's pretty rough for a lot of folks right now, and I want to make sure that you've got what you need to grow your business. Now, a lot of folks have been asking about business websites. First off, I'm Justin Hitt with Ad Briefings Copywriting Tips. And we'll also be delivering this through a couple other channels that I ran, run. But a lot of folks have been asking about their website because we can't have people in the offices. We cannot go to the sites of the customers all due to this quarantine. Now, there are special cases that you can work out on your own. But ultimately, a lot of folks are saying, hey, look, I've got a business website. How do I get more leads and customers from my business website? Well, first off, what you've been told you need is a giant toolbox of everything. Uh, you're told that your website should be introducing the customer to new prospects. It should be generating traffic. It should be doing social media engagement. It should be doing a lot of things that require tools. And guess who's telling you what to do with your business website? Well, yes, it is the tool owners. And that causes a lot of frustration. It causes a lot of challenges. It causes you to be in a state of constant confusion about what tools do we use. So I get a lot of questions about what tools are useful, um, what kinds of things should we be installing on our website, should we use a WordPress blog. Should we, all that does not matter one bit. In fact, these are all simply distractions from your core purpose of business, which I will cover here. In fact, in this program, it is about implementation. It is about core focus. It is about creating and keeping profitable customers. And so we've got to stop with the distractions. Who cares what the latest search engine optimization technique is? Who cares what the latest challenges are with uh, search algorithms? We don't care that there's a new tool out. We don't care if there's a new privacy law. We're going to respect our customers no matter what, and we're going to maintain their privacy. We don't care if there's this big push for content creation. Did you know the big push for content creation is driven by Google, whose primary revenue is based on advertising? See, if you're a service business, if you're a, a consultant or a contractor, uh, you're not selling ads on your site. So who cares about the content? But because you're not selling ads, Google really has no incentive to send you a lot of traffic. And that's just the way things are. Now, there are values in some of this, but most of it is distractions, especially down the bottom technical problems. Uh, some of you folks are on the call today uh, who know about the problems of websites breaking all the time. And again, that's because of all these little pieces gummed all together, uh, held together with duct tape, and ultimately uh, providing what would normally be an experience that... It, it just should be easier. You know, there's a lot of customers trying to give you money and they can't do it. They go to your website. They can't figure out how to call your office, like the basics. So what, what's the real purpose of a business website? What is the one thing that your website ought to do? Well, it's to generate qualified leads and profitable customers. Now, what's important here is that's the purpose of all marketing, whether it's a, a letter you sent in the mail, a postcard that you sent out, a, a an advertisement in a magazine or a publication, uh, your website or anything else. Now, we're going to use the website as the example here because you can optimize a business website and, and really help start understanding the techniques that we're talking about. But ultimately, uh, your website is something top of mind. Let's get started with uh, who I am, because my goal for you today is to have some practical insights you can implement today to op optimize any marketing channel, but to, to practice in the context of your website. And I started out as a systems engineer, a, a computer consultant. I had a computer consultancy business uh, back in the day. I've actually been on the internet since 1989. Uh, here from the Wayback Machine is a picture of one of my old websites back in the year 1996. Uh, where I was providing internet access and technology services. I was basically installing computers. Uh, then we move along to 1999. I've updated the website to talk about strategic relationships, uh, you know, the different core areas of business. Now, the principles that I'm sharing with you here today are not incorporated in my initial website. See, I set up a website and I was all excited about the design and everything. And here we're going to jump ahead to 2003. Uh, I was all excited about the design, but guess what? Nothing happened. 
But that was okay. I had other ways to get customers. I, I was hiring people. I was making about $98,000 a year as a 20-something-year-old kid. But then again, I'd been on the internet since 1989. I've used Gopher and uh, you know Secure Shell and Telnet and all the information services that were available there. And I was able to help my clients do the same in their government contracting businesses, in their uh, technical services businesses, and then help them with the computer uh, electronics part. And I thought, you know what? This, do- this was during the dot com. I thought the technology was the thing. See, solving customer technical challenges with today's technology. Turns out, now that I'm a much older and I've got a lot more experience, the technology is probably the least of your concerns. It really doesn't matter what kind of technology you have as long as you have the right components. So since 1989 and, you know, and running my own company and having my own website, uh, I actually uh, worked for uh, Cox Communications, Landmark Communications, IBM, AT&T, PSI Net. I actually supported um, the buyout of a couple. Uh, there's a lot of mergers and acquisitions during the dot-com. I also have worked for Lillian Vernon and many uh, publishers, including newsletter publishers, and, and many contractors, including electrical contractors, roofing contractors, various types of contractors. And it's always been the same. Again, it has always been the same. Two reasons to have a website is to generate qualified leads and uh, profitable customers. So I'm going to show you how to optimize your site for this. Uh, during the 2000 recession alone, I created $50 million for my clients. I, I actually transitioned in 2001 to being strictly business development. You can see that in the website here. And you'll see that this website no longer has a company. This website is actually a resource that drives to specific market segments. Now, I know that doesn't make a lot of sense to people, but you can see down here, Hit Pansifism was the uh, publishing services company. Uh, all the way back here, I was doing uh, Xerox integration, and then in t- 1999, I started doing down here publishing services. We'd actually had a large number of printers as our clients, uh, and then finally, I, I developed a, a funnel for strategic business opportunities where I essentially generated leads uh, like so, so example right here, this, uh, people who are interested in direct mail would go to this page and I don't know that the page works anymore, but we'll, we'll see here. Uh, and they would actually, you know, ask more inf- for more information. They would generate a lead. I was actually using someone else's articles and ultimately I would take that lead to one of my print shop clients. And so I would go from this simple letter. Now, Joe Vitale, Dan, Ker- uh, Dan Kennedy, Frank Kern, um, there, Russell Brunson's today, but it was um, Jeff Paul before, and um, uh, just, just this whole list of direct marketers that I started to learn from, and I discovered, and we're going to talk about, I don't want to confuse you with the analytics, we're going to talk about that shortly, but I discovered the technical solution isn't always the best solution. In fact, you want solutions that are so easy to implement that even if the entire population of the planet is locked in their homes and shut down, you could still generate customers, build customer relationships, you could still connect with people, you have vendors in place, you have backup vendors, and all that tended to be more of a function of business development rather than uh, marketing of any kind. And it also tended to be more a business development focused on direct response. So here's what's important as the foundation of what I'm going to teach you today. And this is why what you'll learn today is so easy to implement. And, you know, I staged some of this, by the way, and we'll go through it in the context here. Here's PSI Net. If you want a little background information about who they were, uh, they actually was a, were a massive Internet provider. I've, I've actually since then worked at companies and been in the data centers for Google, Amazon. I've been in the data centers for several major banks uh, um, it's been a pr- pretty interesting experience. Here's Cox Communications. Uh, what you want to notice is these are different types of websites. This is a consumer site. Uh, this is a search site. Uh, again, the boats.com is very similar. Uh, Uprox is one of my clients. This is a pure content site. Uh, they would actually do joint ventures with, uh, with different kinds of organizations, and they sell advertising. And finally, uh, Boost Mobile. Uh, we did a project with them. I actually... 
uh, twice in my life have met Snoop Dogg indirectly. Once I was in the LAX airport and he sat down uh, near me with his bodyguards and stuff a long time ago because I was probably the least threat uh, to him as a uh, recording artist. Um, and I was also working, so I really didn't care much. And then again on Boost Mobile, we did a big uh, promotion for him. Um, and this site, Yoprox, didn't know anything about lead generation. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, Lillian Vernon, who believes they're a catalog company and misses out on opportunities that we're going to talk about. And remember, again, the purpose of a website is to generate leads and to make sales that are profitable. So if you're focusing from a business development perspective, your website is only one medium. So I showed you these other sites because Lillian Vernon, for example, has catalogs to sell their products and services. They don't have any services so much as they're, they just have that customization. But they have two primary mediums, the website and a catalog. So a physical catalog. Cox Communications, for example, has the, the website, but they also have regional locations where you can physically go in. So there's drop-off centers. Uh, they also have outbound telemarketing, which is all, which is another medium for their business. All these are ways of generating customers and uh, producing sales. Uh, Boats.com and AutoTrader, uh, they have the sale of advertising as their primary uh, concern. And the optimization on the website itself is mainly ad performance. Now, some of these sites I've worked with have millions of unique visitors a day. And it's in millions of ad impressions. You know, it's a it's a it's a very technical experience. Yet the underlying thing that makes those websites profitable is what we're going to share with you today. Uprox sells advertising. They have reporters out in the field that, that produce uh, news stories, and then they ultimately write those stories and sell ads. Now you'll notice I'm blocking ads. See, that's something that's happening today. I'm blocking 56 ads on this particular site. And uh, if you didn't know about ad blockers, most people who are doing anything useful on the internet are using ad blockers because the sites are junk otherwise. I'm going to show you how to make money on your website, even if the customer is using ad blockers, even if the customer is using uh, the, some of the privacy and security things that are available today that block out the, uh, the tracking keys that you need for retargeting and other things. Uh, and I'm going to ultimately show you how to make money whether or not they even visit your website. Uh, Boost Mobile is a primarily catalog site, just like Verizon. And again, here, Boost Mobile actually has store locations and uh, the website, as well as mailers and a couple other means. My point being is, your business is not your website. Your business is all the means in which you serve customers. Again, that's why business development matters. Um, and in fact, ugly websites can make as much money as pretty websites. I see so many people concerned about the, the, the layout and the views of the website. Look, if you turn off, if you turn on ad blockers and your website looks good, then that's great. But you turn on the, the ads and a lot of their, a lot of their ads are tracking scripts on the, on this main page here. Once you get into content, then you're going to get more ads. And let me just, let me just block that. Cause I, I Oh, I don't like ads at all. Anyway, uh, your website is just one part of your business, and it's primarily, again, to generate leads and to produce customers. The technology doesn't have to be fancy and very often is a distraction when you think about the technology more than anything else. Now, you're going to constantly have people coming to you to share the latest technology, the latest customer relationship management software, the latest website hosting platform, the latest whatever, because they're selling this product and service, and they're going to reach you by every means possible. Again, business development matters because it's the customers you really work for, not these people that sell the tools and products. So if you're buying Facebook advertising, Facebook is going to give you advice that helps them sell more advertising. Same with Google, same with these other platforms. Uh, just to baseline this so that you have a takeaway is that you don't want to get stuck working for the tools. You don't want to get stuck working for the technology. You want to focus on solving customers' problems, your customers' problems. You want to be solving those problems every day and getting paid to do it. So let's go over the five website optimization tenets. 
Okay, these are the core elements that every optimization effort has. This is where you should have a pad of paper aside here. You should close all your browsers, focus specifically on what I'm sharing with you right now, because these are the five optimization tenets that are going to make the massive difference to your ability to generate revenue. It's going to make the difference to your ability to attract the right prospects to your website and buyers. And I, I did give you a little preview of Google Analytics. We we're using Google Analytics to track a lot of this. I'm going to show you how to optimize inside that tool. There's no need to hire somebody to do a lot of this. As the business owner, you should be able to do this in five to 10 minutes a week. But ultimately, you may want a marketing coordinator or some marketing support if you're doing paid advertising of various sorts. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, you're not just throwing people on a web page. We're going to talk about some models here. But let's get started with these five tenets. First, you want three clicks to every visitor objective. Now, what does that really mean? Well, we're going to use a demo website called Job and Procurement. It is a content site that has a newsletter and consulting services. And when I say three clicks to the user objective, we have to first know who is the user or who is the, the desired customer and what are they trying to do. So on Job and Procurement, it is a procurement professional who's trying to get insights in order to improve their procurement career. They're either trying to earn more money, they're trying to find better opportunities, or they're going to get into the business. Now, these are segments, and we're, we're not going to go into detail about segmentation, but just understand that we want three clicks or less to the visitor's objective. So in this case, the visitor lands on the homepage, and they want to know about procurement titles. Okay, now I don't see anything about procurement titles. Uh, now, the little keyword thing might help them get to procurement titles, but we, they probably won't scroll down that far. So they're probably looking for job search resources. Now, this block right here is actually random headlines that we're using for topic testing. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, not going to click there. Uh, and I'm actually using what's called the Onion browser so that I'm, I'm anonymously web surfing the site uh, so that I don't mess up the statistics of my own site. A lot of websites look like they have a lot of traffic, but it's really just the people who work for the company. But here's my first click. I could go to a resource pages, and it will come out to, let me just see if I even clicked it. Your website does need to be fast. Of course, we're broadcasting here, so I'm not sure what's happening. Okay, there you go. This is happens in the Thor, Thor browser. Sometimes the, the things get blacklisted and it won't let you on the site. So uh, my point being is that they would have gone through and if they were looking for content on job skills, I have a little feed element at the bottom. They can get content. Uh, I, there are some resources pages that show them different types of job titles. And then finally, there's a, there's a landing page that has jobs to find. Now, uh, one thing you'll notice on each of these pages is that there is the one thing that has to be on every page, and it's a way to uh, ask for more information. It's an opt-in. So number two, each page has an opt-in or offer. Now, this is a demonstration site, so I do not have an offer on every page. And when we talk about models, there's some places you can put an offer. But I do have this skyrocket your procurement career. That is the core objective of anybody who visits this website. What is the core objective of anybody who visits your website? Now, remember, their objective is not to buy from you. Their objective is to solve problems. How can you help them solve problems? Well, in this case, I'm providing career insights, tips, tools, and uh, to earn top dollar as a procurement professional. Now, when people opt into this list, it is actually an autoresponder. So it sends an ear, a series of letters, and that's it. Again, this is a demonstration website. It just demonstrates technology. It demonstrates models. And essentially, I don't really care it gets any traffic at all. Um, now, we do get some traffic, and we do periodically get inquiries about procurement services. And you might say, well, Justin, if it's a demo website, why does that matter? Well, that's because these five methods work even if you don't have anything to sell. <laughs> so this site, we're actually thinking about hiring a procurement professional to manage the site, uh, and they're going to actually do consulting services. 
But then again, these five steps are so powerful. So number one is three clicks to every visitor objective. I, I should add to that that you want the site to be very fast. Uh, next is going to be each page has an opt-in or offer. You've got to give them a choice. They're either going to join your mailing list or they're going to buy something from you. Uh, number three is you're going to measure lead and sales goals. I know folks talk about engagement. I know folks talk about conversions. I know they talk about everything, but re really, what really matters to the bottom line of your business, and again, this is business development, not internet marketing, is the number of leads and the number of sales you produce. Now, I'm going to show you a chart later that helps you track the monetary values on that, but ultimately, it is leads and sales. That's it. Number four is you want to focus content on the second interaction. Now, what's important to understand, and I learned this a long time ago, is that the majority of your website traffic is not qualified to buy from you. Uh, some of your traffic will be competitors. Uh, one of the reasons I use the Onion browser is because it anonymizes my traffic. It sends it in from multiple countries, which creates some background static that will, um, will not interrupt my normal flow of traffic. And I'm going to show you how that works. Uh, but ultimately, the content needs to connect with real people, and real people visit your site more than once. Now, this is very important to understand. Uh, there's a lot of folks that will tell you about bounce rates and stuff. You can have a 50% bounce rate or even a 80% bounce rate and still have a profitable stream of customers coming from your website. So when you're optimizing your website, you want that second interaction. You want somebody who raised their hand to become a lead and then raised their hand again to read information on your site and then raised your hand again to contact you. Not some college student doing a book report who lands on your website and wanders off anyway. And, and this, is, this is very important. I'm going to show you how to know how that work, how to know where that is. And again, five, you want to measure only real people. One of the feedbacks I get when I show one of these demo sites is they is people say there's not that much traffic going to the website. Well, you know for a fact there's not much traffic to your website, and it doesn't matter how much traffic you have if you don't have these five elements in place because these five elements take prospects, sift and sort them, and turn them into customers. Now, it doesn't matter if we're optimizing a website or a physical presence. Uh, this could be the number of people who come into your offices. Of those people who come into the offices, which ones are qualified and which ones are not? This could be used to optimize the number of people who call into your business asking for information about the business. Do you have information you can send them in a package? Do you have information that would, would give them a reason to provide their full contact information? The same with tra uh, trade booths or even by mail. So keep this in mind. Now, I want to show you why there is a bridge between it's very simple to optimize a website, but it can seem very complicated. And so this is not a technical presentation. Now, the diagram on the right here is a minimal cost network flow model. It represents how a website might be structured where the beginning is a visitor, you know, an uninitiated visitor. And as they navigate through your website, they get to a specific goal, which is on the right side there. Now, this model happens to be measuring the capacity and cost of different travel routes to get from point A to point B. But it could easily be getting someone from visitor to buyer. Now, you don't need to know this model. But if you follow these five steps, your website will be set up in such a way that an analyst can calculate using these types of models the optimal path to get someone from prospect to customer. And these models work consistently across mediums. And so if you use this correctly across the entire business development element of your business, uh, we can tell which salespeople are creating the most sales, what sources are creating the most profitable customers, uh, which advertising medium starts the conversation, and which advertising medium closes the sale. Uh, we can do a lot of optimization things, so these five steps are important because this core optimization allows some kind of nerd or somebody on the back end to do a little bit of math and know with statistical relevance what works and what doesn't. Now, I'd like to show you the website as an example because there's a lot of confusion. Every one of these nodes could be a different tool. Every one of these nodes could be a different marketing medium or a different page on the website. 
I like to show the website too because it's the most practical and you can, for, for no cost to yourself, can get the pieces in place to start this kind of optimization. So let's get into it. Uh, first off, there's some key terms you need to understand. When we say medium, that's the carrier for information. I don't care if it's pigeons. I don't care if it's flyers you threw out of an airplane uh, or letters you've sent. The medium is not your business. The medium is just how you connect with customers. Now, some customers use different mediums than others. Again, we're using a website in this example because everybody seems to have one, even though not everybody needs one. Uh, unique visitor. Unique visitors are real live human beings on the other side of a device. These are buying units. These are decision makers. You don't care about visitors. You care about buyers. Write that down. Buyers, buyers, buyers. Okay, a lead is someone who raises their hand for relevant information. And this is very important. I see a lot of folks giving away tips, che tip sheets, checklists, consultations, initial meetings, all that stuff. It has to be relevant information, again, to make a buying decision. Someone who raises their hand for relevant information, resource, or tools that helps make a buying decision. That's more important than anything else. That's what a lead is. A sale is, is a means of getting a customer. It's not the real purpose of business. It's basically the transaction that starts the customer relationship. And again, as a customer who pays you to solve problems, this is the only true equity in your business. Now, when you have these terms in place, as we walk through this, you will recognize that your website can be a means to sift and sort prospects into customers without a lot of personal interaction. So you can stop the roller coaster income where you're out drumming up business, you get business, and then all of a sudden, all the factors involved in getting business can't be done because you're serving the customer. Well, you'll be able to have your website do this for you. But again, remember, the website is just a medium. It could be a, a series of letters. It could be a, a call sequence. It could be someone sitting on the phone. It could be an outbound call or it could be an inbound call. It could be a lot of things. Again, it all breaks down into the two purposes. One, generate a lead. The other, a customer. And here's where we start with our interaction process. Now, I touched basically on customer interaction points. Customer interaction points is anywhere a customer may interact with you, your product, or the problems that make your product necessary. In the context of a website, we have a simple lead or opt-in inter interaction. The customer lands on a page. They get the opportunity to opt-in, and, the, and there's got to be a reason to opt-in. They don't just land on this page and say, oh, well, look, there's a form. Let me fill that form out. You know, people don't do that. They get too much email today. Nobody wants to fill out a form. Now, on some of my sites, I've got a form that has name, address, and phone number. It has a lot of information, a lot of information that people don't want to necessarily enter. And so you've got to give them a really good reason why. And then finally, you have a goal. You have, after they've put their information in, they get something. This is their objective. Now, again, this is the three steps. Step number one, landing on a page. Step number two is the opt-in. Step number three, they get what they were, they came for. Now, this is important because if they don't get what they, they came for, that third click will be someplace else. They'll, they'll close the browser. They'll wander off. Uh, and, and ultimately, you got to make it pretty easy. Now, they might have three clicks into additional content. That's a different kind of person than someone who opts in to get a free gift or they get or they schedule an appointment. The next function is sales or e-marketing or, or e-commerce interactions. Now, again, it's it's prospect present close. No different than calling somebody up on the phone, scheduling an appointment and then doing a sales presentation to close the sale. So you have sources. Email, postcards, letter, retargeting, pay-per-click, you know, pigeons, skywriting, whatever. You have some kind of presentation, a sales letter, a special report, some kind of webinar, some kind of event where they're engaged and they're getting their pre-sales questions answered. And then finally, you have a close. You'll notice on the, the close and the goal, that third step is always your goal. Number of leads, number of sales is the third step. Now, this is something you might have noticed already. Let's get over here to the contact page. I'll show you real quick how to contact me. 
And look at this. Okay, now it's blocked here, but there's a big form down on the bottom that has all full contact detail. Oh, there it is. See this? Nobody's going to fill this form out unless they're going to get something that they want. Um, your contact page can be your opt-in page, but I, I'm going to show you how to do a little bit more than that. Uh, but ultimately, here's how to contact me uh, as, as far as uh, things are concerned, and this would be that third step. The first step might be the home page, the second step might be about, and the third step might be contact. Now again, yes, can they get to the contact page faster? Certainly. They're not always going to do so, and those other steps qualify them. But here's what you've got to understand. It's the same process, but they're different prospect states. Someone who lands on the, the website here, Job and Procurement, is a procurement professional interested in improving their career. Someone who goes to feeds is a procurement professional who's interested in improving their career but hasn't found answers on this website. Somebody who goes to jobs is a procurement professional who wants a job in procurement and they're going to go someplace to look at jobs. They don't need insights on how to apply to jobs. They're looking for jobs to apply to. There are different prospects. They're in a different stage or state. Now, of course, somebody who, who opts in is most interested in what you have to offer because they want to specifically earn top dollars as a procurement professional. What is it for your website? For my website, it's con it's consulting and, and, uh, and services related to consulting. For other sites, it could be scheduling that appointment. But again, the th same three steps, but a different person. The initial person who visits is an unknown prospect. They opt in and become a lead. Now, as a lead, we kind of have an idea about why they opted in because of the opt-in page or the landing page. And then ultimately, uh, their next step is to become a sale. So again, it's the same three steps. We are always focusing on the second interaction in all of these because what our core objective is to modify behavior to create more buyers. So we'll be focusing on getting the opt-in for the lead funnel and getting the presentation for the sale funnel. If you get those things right in front of the right people who are qualified to be your customer, the, the whole thing will move smooth. Now, I did mention a little bit of math. You're not going to have to do any math to implement what we're discussing today, but I would need the math or some kind of analyst or marketing professional would need the math to know whether the findings from tests on your website are statistically accurate. Now, that's very important. We are focusing on repeatable behaviors. We want to modify the behavior of visitors or prospects in our marketplace so that they buy from us over anybody else. This is psychology. This is statistics. This is bottom line, getting your solutions in front of customers who want to pay for them. So if you, if you don't have at least 100 unique visitors a day from all sources on your website, then it's going to be hard to get to a statistically accurate number. How do you increase the number of visitors or the number of connects? Well, again, you might not get 100 visitors at your website, but you could make 50 phone calls a day and send out 50 letters a day, and now you've got 100 uh, connects, and you, you can start using this optimization, me me this optimization system in order to measure and focus those efforts on people who buy. Uh, you need a means of tagging prospects. Now, this could be individual spreadsheets. This could be a, a customer relationship management system, but when you capture emails or postal addresses or, or telephone numbers or something, you want to be able to put them somewhere. So if I hold a webinar, I'm going to actually pull the caller ID data and load that into a database so that I can use it in the marketing effort. People who signed up for a webinar are different people than who showed up for a webinar. And the people who show up for a webinar and stayed the full length of the webinar are different people than people who just dialed in initially and dropped off. So you're going to want to be able to measure these different elements, and you need a place to store this information. But again, you can do this in a spreadsheet. You can do this from rented mailing lists. It doesn't have to be a, a big integration project with thousands of pieces. You want to focus on behavior rather than simple measures. I don't care about engagement. I don't care how long they stay on the website. I don't care about anything other than their behavior. And I'm going to need 100 behaviors, so 100 people who requested information. I'm going to need 100 people who bought a product in order to do some kind of comparison. So if we're doing an A-B test, I need 100 people to take action on one side before I can determine if the A-B split test is a 
is good. Now, you don't need to know what split testing is, but if you see numbers that are smaller than 100 actions, then they're always suspect, okay, and you want more testing. We also want to summarize our findings outside the website tools, and we want to summarize our findings for all mediums. So if you mailed 100 letters and you made 100 phone calls and you had 100 people visit the website, we want to be able to compare to see which ones had the greatest value for producing or creating or keeping profitable customers. Now, the keeping is an important part, too. We don't just want to get customers and make sales. We want to get keep customers over time, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Now, you might be saying, well, Justin, you haven't shown me anything about actual optimization in your website. Everybody else is talking about search engine tools. Everybody else is talking about tweaks and page. I'm telling you, none of that matters. What matters is business development. But there is one tool that we're going to use in this demonstration. It's called Google Analytics. And it helps us visualize what we're seeing as far as the optimization actions. So in this next section, I'm going to walk you through the five points I just described. I'm going to walk you through everything I've shown you so far in a practical implementation that you ought to be able to do at the end of this call very easily to start optimizing your business. Now, I'm using Google Analytics as the tool that's measuring visitors to the website. There are thousands of other tools. It doesn't matter which one you use. We can make this model work for them. I'm using the Onion browser in order to create some, some static in the background and, and kind of block out all the tracking tools so that I can see if the website works correctly for the minimal uh, browser type or the minimal interaction, but I can also not in influence my statistics because very often what you'll find is the, the landing page your, your web developer is working on today is the landing page that has all the traffic, and then when they're not working on it, it's got no more traffic. I actually filter out bots, spiders, uh, my development teams, my own website addresses, and then I use tools that uh, proxy or anonymize my access, uh, like a VPN, for example, uh, in order to visit the website to do the maintenance uh, so that I'm not inter interrupting the, uh, the clear measures to know what works and what doesn't. And finally, you're going to have at least one lead generation campaign or one sales offer. So uh, the demo site job and procurement, the one lead generation is the skyrocket your procurement career, and the one sales offer uh, would be resources, uh, but they're embedded deeper in the site. One thing I did want to make sure you understand is that you don't have to have two separate interactions. You can actually put the interactions together. You can have a visitor land on the website, opt in for something, and then on the confirmation page, track the goal, but then offer the sale right away. So I think this one here uh, offers an initial consultation. I know for sure that my private announcement list does um, offer an initial consultation, but the model is this is the same. Step one, step two, step three. It's Brian Tracy's prospect, present, and close. You're closing on being a lead, and then you're closing on being a lead to create a smaller list that you can then follow up on with more focused marketing efforts. And then finally, when people buy, now you have a list of customers. Okay, again, I talked about the demo site. It's the, the job and procurement site. And here's our simple tracking sheet. Now, I'm not going to go into the tracking here today, but here are the elements that we're talking about tracking. You want to have some kind of source and medium, and that source and medium is you know, where they came from. So it's Google, organic traffic from Google. It's pay-per-click tra traffic from Google. Uh, we want to know how many actions were taken, so that might be how many times somebody clicked an ad. We want to know how many time, how many leads did that ad produce and how many sales were produced from those leads. We are measuring the first 30 days. We're not worried about, you know, seven years later. We're worried about the first 30 days of an active campaign. And ultimately, we want to get our sales and our leads generated as quickly as possible. And if you get more advanced in this stuff, there are ways to calculate break-even points. There are ways to know whether the leads you're getting are worth having. But the key part of this is to understand that we're also tracking the costs. If that pay-per-click campaign costs us $250, we want to know it. If it generates $100 in direct income in a very short window, we want to know it. And then, of course, we measure profits so we can calculate some of the basic core measures that we can talk about at another time. The, the CLV is your cost, uh, is your customer lifetime value. 
and your repeats are the number of times that original source and medium combination came back to do something like buy. Okay, we don't care if they come back and become a lead again. We care that they, that original source combination uh, creates a second sale, which is a better indication of a customer. So somebody might buy something just out of curiosity, but they aren't going to buy two things out of curiosity. It just doesn't work that way. Again, this is about behavioral modification, not about the basics that you're going to see everywhere else. And again, I promised you something of immense value that you can use right away. And we're about to walk into that. So I'm going to I'm going to hold on this slide right here and I'm going to get you over to the uh, website page. This is our Google Analytics account behavior behavior flow. Again, we are using behavioral modification on our visitors. This is a year's worth of traffic because there's not a lot of traffic here. And here's that uh, main page I was talking about, which is the sample procurement titles. It's like the most popular page on the site. Now, let's get right back to our five points. Now, I'm not going to bring them up on the screen. I have them right in front of me right here. I want to even quiz you a little bit. What are the two, the two most important things every website, every website page should do? Okay, well, it's qualify leads and create profitable customers. If you got that wrong, you're going to want to re-listen to this entire program. Okay, the five website optimization tenets is three clicks for every visitor. Okay, our first click is is from the source. So this is on some other website. The source is where they came from. Now, again, this can be a rented mailing list. It could be a postcard sent to a rented mailing list. It could be a letter sent to a rented mailing list that puts them to some starting page. It could be a pay-per-click campaign. It could be Google's organic traffic. Now, if you haven't seen the similarity between the network diagram I showed you up front and this behavioral flow, uh, understand that this is where people start over here on the left and they finish over here on the right. The third interaction, you see first interaction is prospect, second interaction is present, and third interaction is close. You want your second and third interactions to be goals. That the objective of visiting the website. In this case, we're seeing that the the starting page is a uh, there's some popular pages. One's the home page, and one is this sample procurement titles. Okay, so the the home page and the uh, I'm not going to pull up the sample because they had a little a uh, little blocking in there, uh, but ultimately the home page has an opt in right here. And then it has more information through these here. Oh, there's your sample procurement titles. Notice how this was random. That's so we can do topic testing. Uh, I am testing the clicks on these, so I'm not going to click it. Uh, but this tells me what content is most interesting when people land on the few pages that have this little test on it. Uh, and then down at the bottom, we have the catch-all. So this is actually a, a pyramid. Uh, at the very top of the page, we have this the specific objective for both the visitor and eventually what we want them to do. It broadens a little bit. They have the choice between going and getting additional content or getting a special report. And then finally, as you get to the bottom, it's very broad. It's basically saying, we didn't catch your attention in the first screen. We didn't catch it in the second screen. So please click something down here, which could include search. So again, our, our next is we're measuring lead and sales goals. That's important. Finally, we're focusing on content for the second interaction. So I don't really care what landing page they came on. That's part of my source material. Uh, what is the source of sales? Well, the, the, the source of sales is this landing page versus that landing page. What I care about is second interaction. Now, you might be saying, well, Justin, man, you got 3,000 sessions and 3,000 people dropped off. That's a high bounce rate. But that doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter at one bit at all. What matters to me is that six people got to the contact page in their second interaction. So remember, it's like a moving parade. The, the parade is transforming as it moves down the road, and, the, and it's walking in front of different audiences all the time. The parade is, is contextually different. Like your ads today with coronavirus going on are going to act differently than ads before the coronavirus or after the coronavirus. So we want that second interaction as a proof to know that person has some level of interest. So if we follow the little lines here, they landed on the con on the home page, and then they ended up on the contact page here, or they ended up on the contact page here, 
Uh, that's a different person than someone who landed on a job titles page and then ended up on the contacts page. And you'll notice the job titles page, home page, and then contacts page. See, they're not jumping straight to contacts from the uh, the main page. Now, they might, but again, we're looking at usually the top 10 sources, and we're looking at behavior in a very short window. So let me point out here, this website could have millions of unique visitors a day. I filtered out on analytics to focus on those people who are taking behavioral actions in a very short window. So this is about people who took action in a short time frame. It, in, in a year's worth of traffic, there could be, you know, if you're using audience or you're using uh, landing pages, there could be a lot of impressions. There could be a lot of unique visitors. But ultimately, which ones walk down the path that we're trying to measure? And the end of that path is a sale or it's a lead. Uh, at the beginning of the path is the problems that our prospect or our customer is facing. So I, I, wanna, I want this to sink in a bit. If we're looking at the second second interaction, if we fil filtered out all the spiders, if we filtered out all the bugs, we should be able to go to our contact management system and see how many of the six that made it to the contact page in the same time period became leads. That is a conversion rate that matters. That is a measure that tells us about behavior. That is something that helps us understand the value of a marketing campaign. If our Google brought us 1,300 1, visitors or users, these are user sessions, and only six of them ever made it down here to the contact page, then we've got, we don't need to put much effort into that. See, a lot of folks are talking about content marketing. A lot of folks are talking about uh, driving traffic to their website. Uh, but ultimately, traffic and content doesn't really matter if it's not producing leads and sales. So let's follow this down here. We got Google Organic. It's producing about 37% of its traffic is going to this landing page of job titles. And then from this, uh, we have 48% of the traffic drop off. And we have, got to get the mouse just right, uh, we have uh, none of those people going to become part of our to the contact page uh, now again they could have uh, opted in and an opt-in page will be prefixed with thanks okay that's the key we're using to, to track the goal so I don't see any thank thank you pages in here and I don't see any thank you pages in here on the second interaction so I would need to optimize this in order to increase traffic now what would I want to do now, some people will say you want to go in and change your landing pages. Okay, so if you got 100 landing pages and some landing pages are getting traffic, but they're not producing leads, then you want to change your landing page. That's completely wrong. Uh, what you actually do is create new landing pages and then look also at the technical optimization to make sure the techniques, technical stuff's not in the way. So, for example, if I came in here, I'm, uh, this is a test site, so I don't really care if, it, if we mess up the, tra the tracking. Uh, if we go to the sample titles page, and it is uh, it is difficult to read. Uh, if we go to this this sample page and it is not working correctly, maybe there is a widget somewhere. Like maybe there's supposed to be an opt-in widget down here somewhere, and the opt-in widget's not there. See, those are the types of things you'll fix on the landing page. Otherwise, you'll create a new landing page with everything you know about landing pages that convert to test against this landing page with a bunch of traffic. Now, you could even put in place, and this is where an analyst will help, you can even put in an A-B split so you can create a new landing page that is sample procurement titles. You could test three headlines so that we're not just looking at sample procurement titles. We're looking at uh, procurement titles or, or job titles for procurement professionals. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to test something and measure it by the opt-ins. Now, if I was to optimize this page, I would put a an opt-in down at the bottom. I also want to make sure that my Google Analytics is tracking these clicks to go away from the site because we noticed that 40, we got 48% of traffic is going someplace other than the website itself. So we might want to see what we can do to offer there. You might offer a pop-up, you might offer a rollover. Now I use Google Analytics, uh, a Google Tag Manager in order to offer things specific to individual pages. So that, that's something that would allow me to 
offer a pop-up just on this page or just on my top five traffic pages only if the pop-up came from a certain source. That's where it can get technical, but when you're simply just optimizing, you want to take your top pages, clone them in a way that it becomes new content, focusing on a new opt-in. So it is a landing page, uh, and, and then uh, measure that performance as things move along. Um, I know this sounds really simple. I know a lot of folks listening right now are saying, Jesus Christ, Justin, you gave me all that stuff in order to basically show me to clone my best performing pages with a B-side test and track it all on a single spreadsheet rather than in all the tracking tools. Okay, well, I'll admit it is a little bit more than that, uh, but, but that's the gist of it. Three steps, prospect, present, and close. If what you're doing to prospect is not generating leads, you test against what you're already doing. You don't change it. You test against what you're doing. You take the ones that are the worst performers and dump them off, but we wouldn't know what's the worst performers if we don't get enough count. Uh, you can take the things that have no traction, just dump them after 30 days. Uh, but again, everything that works well after 30, the first 30 days, you're going to repeat doing that with a test against it. Yes, it can be that simple. Now, of course, this doesn't sell consulting services. This doesn't sell, uh, you know, me doing it for you. It, it really is as easy as this for yourself to do. You basically make a list of all the marketing campaigns that you're doing and the ones that work well, you do them again and you test against them. And then the ones that are doing bad, you just stop doing. Okay, so we're going to get back into the presentation. The whole marketing performance optimization is basically having measures in place to optimize all marketing channels. So on the website, it really is that easy. But when you've got five or six marketing channels, like maybe a catalog, maybe people come into your office, maybe you make outbound calls, maybe you have the website, and maybe you also have a trade show booth once a year. That's five channels that you're going to need to measure and optimize on a regular basis. So... Uh, the optimization, yes, is just five steps. It is very simple, uh, but ultimately it gets complex as you increase your volume. And I know that's why a lot of folks stop doing the marketing that works because it gets boring. It, it really does get boring and you want to go do something else. Uh, let me give you a quick example about the prospect present close in a trade show booth situation. I know you're not doing trade shows right now, but you might be doing webinars or virtual demonstrations. And so your prospect is putting the demonstration in front of the right people. The demonstration itself is the present. And then the close would be something you ask in the presentation to see if the customer wants more information or the customer wants that demonstration done on their site. Do you see how that works? It doesn't have to be a 35 step campaign. It doesn't have to be a, you know, a multivariant tested. It just is simply, am I standing in front of the right people? Am I sharing something they're interested in? And by the way, folks, if you're interested, raise your hand and let's get you started today. Okay, you're going to do your measures on a weekly basis until it's routine. Now, I actually have a daily measure for the first 30 days of a campaign. If a campaign doesn't work in the first 30 days, it isn't going to magically work in the next 50 days or the next 90 days. Um, it will. Uh, it, you need to run it till you get enough samples, but ultimately measuring daily for the first 30 days and then rolling up your measures every week for all campaigns that are active will give you enough information. But here's the little business development um, connect. You want to then start mapping it into your profit and loss statements, your balance sheet, and your overall business metrics. Now, here's one thing I do for my clients is they can know which marketing campaign created customers with the highest lifetime value, meaning which campaign created customers that were worth the most profits in the first 12 months or the first 24 months, depending on your length of your sales cycle. And then at the end of the month, they know which campaigns produced, but which customers produced and what products produced so that the next several months can be set up in a marketing calendar in order to focus marketing campaigns, not only on campaigns that generate leads, not only campaigns that generate sales, but campaigns that generate leads that create, that buy profitably the products and services that you offer. This ties into your project management. This ties into your procurement and will let you forecast 
your uh, company's workload. Like Lillian Vernon, for example, which catalog items on which page of the catalog sold the most? If we're going to send a catalog with that combination in place, how many items do we need in the warehouse so that we can deliver product on time? If you've got uh, a 15 technical uh, technician needs 15 hours on every job, you can only do 20 jobs a month, and you're doing a marketing campaign that produces 10 new jobs, you have to be careful running that campaign because you could have more work than you have people to do the work. See, too much traffic to a website can actually put you out of business, and I've seen that a number of times as well. So the business development methodology is integrating the optimization of all marketing channels into the operations of your business, into your forecasting and planning, so that you earn enough money in the business to keep doing it. And again, we use marketing coordinators, we use business analysts, and we do this as a strategic side of your overall business. But the very basic observation that we've shown here and the very basic philosophy of behavioral modification can be used today to optimize your business with no special help from the outside world. Again, I promised you something you can implement right now and today. Uh, you want to constantly test your understanding of specific buyers. If you find something in your data, I want you to test it. If you noticed that uh, I worked with a heavy equipment operator and the people who rented Bobcats, uh, Bobcats were different people than who rented excavators. And the people who rented excavators tended to be plumbing companies. And the ones who rented Bobcats tended to be excavators. Uh, uh, like construction and excavation folks. So these are two different segments. Now, how do you test that? Well, you, you do a campaign to plumbing people that offers them an excavator or a bulldozer or the bobcat, and then you measure which one picks which. And then if they pick the excavator, your assumption was correct, and you follow it up with a campaign that specifically offers them excavators. Now, throughout all this, you've got to make sure you do it profitably. You wouldn't want to buy one day, get one day free if that's going to lose you money. But you now could, could set up the association between contractors who do plumbing and contractors, uh, contractors who do plumbing and renting of excavators and stop sending them as many offers for bulldozers. Or bobcats. They already know you've got that. You can do uh, you can do a customer retention plan where you then um, you know do consulting and work with them to see what their needs are, and then you can forecast which equipment they want to use. You want to seek maximum utility on your website. Okay, you don't want to wait for visitors to show up. But when they do show up, you want that site to solve problems for them up front. This is a demonstration of value that you have. So if you're the heavy equipment operator, you're going to have landing pages that are basically operational, how to use the equipment. It's not how to solve problems without the equipment or not how to dig holes by yourself. It's how to use the choose the right equipment for your job. And then once you've chosen the equipment for your job, how to use it correctly. And then ultimately in that, you're going to generate the lead to know who is looking for equipment to use and who is looking for equipment just for the information of looking for equipment. Okay, does this all make sense? Does this sound like something you can do? I'm going to give you a brief summary of what we've covered today. Um, but if, again, if you have any questions about this or any other program, this is actually program code 001-GL3. Uh, and if you ask questions and include that code 001-GL3, I will be more than happy to answer any questions you have. Now, you and I are not going to be pen pals. We're not going to get on the phone and answer them. But again, if you fax in your questions, I will give you a written or I will give you a video or I will give you some kind of audio answer. And it will be put here with this presentation so that everybody can benefit from the questions that, that maybe I've done something unclear. Now, I'm not a consultant. I'm not a coach. I'm not anything other than a business analyst. I dig down into businesses to boost cash flow, to attract and create profitable customers, and to turn business relationships into profits. We are talking about behavioral modification, and we're modifying the behavior of the customer so that they can solve their problems faster. Now, again, they're going to solve their problems in a way that's profitable to you. I want to loop back to my original premise of this entire presentation, and that is 
that the reason you have these mistakes and false beliefs about optimizing your website and the reason why you don't see how easy it is to optimize a website and how it's just one, two, and three uh, is because all of these businesses, every one of these audience marketing tools, local channel marketing, assets and resources, call management, customer relationship management systems, business intelligence, all of these people are seeking to modify your behaviors and beliefs so that you buy their products and services. Now, again, this, this video is going primarily to my clients. The people who are on the call live right now are customers and they are engaged in services. You, there's nothing else to buy. I wanted to share with you this model to help you understand that all of these distractions can be taken away. The key reason you must know about these distractions and the reason why people don't get upset with all the different tools and the promises and that are being broken is because we're so busy looking at our screens that we're not even noticing the change around us. When there wasn't a web browser back in 1989, there was Gopher. And if you needed information, you went to Gopher and you searched for it and you found it and you were done. Okay, you didn't have to go jump through a lot of hoops. Now, if you wanted additional information, you could simply contact the author of the page and they would get back with you. Now, I get thousands and thousands of emails every day and it's, it's ridiculous at times. I don't have time to go and answer every question, but I can package that information together and provide it to you like I've done in this presentation. And this is the practical implementation, folks. Pay very close attention. I can package it up here and I can say to you, hey, by the way, folks, you've got questions. Now, to my customers, I just sent them an email or I sent them, a, I mentioned it in the newsletter. You guys have questions. If you're interested in answers, click the here and ask your question. And I'm going to share with you a presentation I've done and, and then, of course, answer any of the questions that you have. They come to the landing page, they enter the information. I send them to a thank you page, tells them when the seminar is going to be, uh, what are we going to cover in the seminar, all that's from a basic outline. And then now they've gotten what they want, and I got what, they, what I wanted. I wanted to know who is interested in such and such a solution. Now, at the end of this presentation, I said, by the way, folks, those of you who have stayed with me to the end of the presentation, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. All you've got to do is raise your hand and send your question by email or by fax. Now, I'm going to answer some questions uh, here at the end of the presentation, but ultimately, you raise your hand. Now, I've captured the people interested in questions. I know they were on the webinar. I now have can put them in a different column of my sp spreadsheet. They went from leads to uh, sales if this was a paid presentation or something I did on site. And then ultimately, I can move them along to their second interaction. But at the end of that, I'm going to fulfill the question by sending them an answer. At the very end of this presentation, I also have for a paid consultation right here, I'm setting the criteria in which they can take this next step. So it's raise your hand if you want a resource. I give them a resource. Inside the resource, I say, raise your hand again if you have questions. I answer the questions. In the answers to the questions, I say, raise your hand again if you'd like to hire me to help you. It's that same three steps over and over and over again, okay? And the reason we're doing that is because it's a different prospect as they move down the funnel. The person who just landed on a page is a different person than who made a second interaction who visited the contact page. We're developing and building context. We're developing and building context to know who's interested in doing business and who's not. We're trying to be what Dan Kennedy calls the welcome guest instead of the uninvited pest. And by doing this, we need to know more about the other person. There are privacy concerns that we want to be aware of. But ultimately, the, the more interactions they have with you, the less you need to worry about the privacy because they've given you a lot of information about them. If you're going to hire me for a paid consultation, I do require an assessment in advance, but this is not about you hiring me for a paid consultation. I put this in here so that you know that you can write in with your questions and they will be answered. Boy, I know I've covered a lot in this presentation. I've... Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I've talked too fast or I burned anybody out, but if there's folks still on the call, 
I will answer some of your questions. Now, if you're getting an edited version of this, of course, uh, you can uh, download the slides and you can contact us uh, through the jwhco.com or through whatever newsletter that you found this. But we're at the end, and this really is not monkey business. It's monkey money. And it, optimizing your business website really is about simplifying the process in order to zero in on what you have. So if you've got a question, I want you to ping it over. i got two screens here. I'm going to see your question on the other screen, and then I'll quickly summarize it. Again, we have this presentation available for download uh, in the, uh, the tutorial. Uh, this is a free uh, presentation for my clients. If it is available in the future, it may be a paid uh, solution because I did deliver to you a massive value with this simple implementation technique of looking at the second interaction. You might have been looking at conversion rates. You might have been looking at other things. But again, we want to filter out those tire kickers. We want to filter out those non-buyers. And we want to drive in to target. Okay, so we have a question here about remarketing. <coughs> I had mentioned Google Tags. And I had mentioned remarketing, uh, and um, that has to do with cookies and other things like that. So on your website, you're going to have uh, cookies. We're, we're checking our site with, with a, uh, the Onion browser in order to block most of the cookies and tracking tools. So if you look at the source, you're going to see a lot of opt-in tracking. You're going to see... Um, you know, different types of Google Analytics scripts. You're going to see uh, pixels, different types of things that are used so that I can uh, I can build audiences. So somebody who comes from Facebook to a landing page and then converts to be a lead is a different person than someone who comes from LinkedIn to a landing page and converts to a lead. Both LinkedIn and Facebook have audience targeting. The reason I use Google Tags is because... I can basically only show the I can basically show only the Facebook tracking tag to people who came from Facebook. Now again, I told you this was not going to be a technical presentation. If you need more details, we'll go into the technical parts here. But what we're doing is we're filtering out those individuals who are just general visitors. So someone from LinkedIn is going to be more business oriented. Uh, someone from Facebook is going to be more socially oriented. Someone from Facebook, in the context of the click, is more socially oriented. See, I have, I have a minor in psychology. I've been fascinated about uh, behavioral modification and the use of relationships and, and propaganda and a lot of other things. Um, but what ends up happening is we want to uh, to step into the minds of our prospect. If they're coming from Facebook... They're a different person than if they came from LinkedIn. So let's track them in different segments. One segment is going to match an audience on the Facebook platform, and one segment's going to match an audience on the LinkedIn platform. And now I can say to the LinkedIn segment, hey, link, hey, business folks, are you looking to grow your business? I can say to the Facebook folks, hey, hey, are you looking to grow your free time? And then I can test those two concepts. Now, the, the pixels are tracking on all goal pages. So uh, my Facebook pixel and my LinkedIn pixel will also engage on the, uh, the confirmation pages, which are the last step in this, in this here, the goal. So my Facebook pixel, my LinkedIn pixel will be on the goal because if they made it as far as the goal, but maybe they didn't come from Facebook, I might want to invite them back with re remarketing on the Facebook platform. Now, remarketing with Google works a little bit different, and I'm using Google Analytics on all pages, and I do that with a plugin inside of my content platform. But the key of understanding is, is that there are different people. I want to know about my behavior of Facebook people before I put more money into Facebook advertising. I want to know about the behavior of LinkedIn people before I put more LinkedIn there. Now, on the job and procurement site, is it's a, it's a demo site. I'm actually also doing Google AdSense, and that gives me some information. Uh, I put the Google AdSense on every page. I could put Google AdSense on pages with high traffic and low conversion in order to generate a little bit of revenue and a little bit more information about the individuals. 
Uh, there are audience uh, behavioral demographics that tell you a little something about each of the sites. Uh, well, each of these tools have the behavioral demographics, and they th these demographics tell me that the majority of visitors are male. Uh, that's something in the procurement field that would be strange. So that would help shape content to say, so if my LinkedIn, my Facebook, and my main site say that the majority of the people visiting the site are male in an industry that's primarily female, I could then do a call out for that. Uh, I could call it out and I could say, hey, you know, if you're a man in a woman dominated field and affirmative action makes you feel like you're behind, well, really, it's, it's here are the five things to do. Here are the three things to do. Now, I also noticed that the age demographic, which will be different by platforms, LinkedIn will be a little bit older age demographic. Uh, and then the uh, Facebook will be a little lower demographic. Well, if the demographic that tends to convert is 60 is, is 45 and older, that's a different message than somebody who's 25 to 34. So by using the retargeting segmented by the origination of the visitor, like where did they come from? Let's talk with them in the context of where they came from. Uh, we're able to then go back and then tune in our, our, our audience. So if we know overall it's a 45 to 54-year-old audience that buys, I can go filter out the 25s and 34-year-olds from Facebook and focus in on the older uh, prospect. Uh, so this is the, the tweaking and tuning that happens after you get your, your main um, deep dive or measures, and it's going to help you get a better context in order to to then zero in on your marketing dollars, because the real goal here is for every dollar of marketing spent, you want to get uh, four or five dollars in revenue. And if you get a customer through break even, meaning everything you spent to get that customer, they buy and, and it profits just enough to pay for what you spent. That's good too, because again, we're focusing on second interaction. We want that first sale to get the customer, and the second sale to keep the customer. So that's where a retargeting comes in, and we use the retargeting focused on the goal and the origination source because the origination sources are different. Uh, people who come from Facebook or other social media platforms, uh, they're usually not looking for information like someone who's coming from a search engine. And then if somebody's coming from a... Uh, you know, if they're coming from Amazon, they're, they're actually looking for content answers and very often you can offer them a special report and they'll have a better response to a special report. Uh, there are a lot of factors in here that we can drill down after we have a better understanding of, of who is our buyer. Uh, but a lot of this is a distraction when you look at the, you know, there's been 3,000 sessions and 52 of them came from social media and 36 of them converted into some kind of, you know, goal. Um, you want to... Um, it doesn't mean that they all came the, that social media folks turned into customers. Um, it could be, you know, it could be one landing page over another. Uh, here's that source medium that we're talking about in the tracking sheet. Uh, well, you know, from a goal perspective, sure they came from social media, but according to this, they didn't have any tracking codes on them, and Facebook didn't bring any goals. So a lot of times what will happen is a client will get into the data and it'll be a real mess. So what I try to do is translate that. To finish up the retargeting question, um, I would probably want to retarget Google anal Google platforms first before I would retarget my Facebook for, for what the data is showing me right now uh, because I don't have any hard conversions here. Now, that could mean the tracking didn't work out. That could mean that they, they're using a private browser. That could mean that they are, they're doing, they got ad blockers. That could mean a lot. But again, we are only measuring what we, we would know, and we would check our measure with e-commerce measures. Now, this is a demo site. It doesn't have any e-commerce functions in it. So, But your site would have dollars here. Uh, okay, we got another question about how do we tie back the dollars in our platform like QuickBooks or, uh, you know, our management software that's doing the, the transactions to Google Analytics or whatever analytics tool we're using. Well, that's kind of a technical question, but let me give you the brief short uh, course. Uh, you can actually set up triggers in the background to trigger or in your goal coding, you could actually uh, feed that data. Um, Lily and Vernon, for example, they, they have uh, custom code 
Uh, probably today they're not using custom code, but all the catalog platforms have some kind of code that on the checkout or confirmation page, you're going to have an kind of a, you know, it kind of maps it. So for example, on ad briefings, my site, so I have a lot of customers who are publishers. And I, so, so a lot of times what you'll have is some programs that you're offering. Now, again, I'm trying, I'm doing this in Chrome, so I'm messing up my stats, but I'm just doing it real quick. Um, just to show you. So here are the different programs you can choose from. When you sign up for a program, uh, the sign up is the opt-in. And then when you make the payment, it tracks the payment on the confirmation page. And all that stuff feeds back here. Again, you don't have to worry about the technical side. You just have to worry about the three, uh, the three simple steps, which is where do they come from? How do they become, you know, what page helped them become a customer or a lead? And then ultimately closing out that goal. We're at an hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to take one more question and then I'm going to wrap it up uh, because I have a, another appointment here uh, to go to. Uh, we're in the monkey business. If you've got questions still after I terminate this call, uh, you're certainly welcome to visit the website. And uh, it'll be www.jwhco.com. Uh, on that website, you'll see in the lower corner a an opt-in box. No, you'll see a... Yes, da, 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 da. You will see a little tiny button that you can click and you can ask your questions there. Be sure to mention program code 001-GL3. And so if you come down here and you do 001-GL3 uh, and then ask your question, I'll know it's from this program and I'll be able to uh, give you better context of what we're talking about here. Uh, I could be running five to ten campaigns all at one time. Uh, so your questions really help me focus on your question with the context of the ad code. It really helps me get you the right answer. So the last question we have here is, uh, once on your mailing list, what do you do with your prospects? Okay, so once somebody is... On your mailing list, whether it's AWeber, Infusionsoft, HubSpot, uh, it doesn't matter what, what program you're using. Once they're on your mailing list, you are now offering them something different. Again, you don't have to generate a lead again because you already know who the people are. You are now in the position where you want to research and build out the context of each of those individuals. Now, all of my customers office offer high-ticket products. $1,000 profit per transaction, ten dollars to $20,000 per job. Uh, the, the reason I could create uh, $50 million in a recession in 2000 is because my client's deals were between a million and $8 million each. And some of them were 18 and 25 million, depending on what's happening. But the, 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 the 12 month window in which we did that measure, the majority of the sales were like $5 million, you know, a uh, million dollars. Um, so what I'm looking at doesn't require a whole lot of people to come in the door, but they must be qualified people. They must be people who have gone through the steps necessary to be qualified. So you can't afford to follow up on everybody. Now, maybe at that ticket value, you can follow up on everybody. But ultimately, if you can get a large number of people into a, an opt-in mailing list, you're going to have more options in the future. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of the uh, the t magazines have lists and stuff. You're basically creating yourself a small medium, your own medium, which is your website. Um, but you might also want to have an offline prospect newsletter. You may want to have other things because in a business to business sale, you could have five decision makers. So one decision maker from the company raises their hand and says, Hey, I'm interested in what you've got to offer. Uh, you may want to come back and research the other people at the same company and then get them on your mailing. So you don't need any permission to send somebody a letter in the mail. Uh, so we're doing a project, a joint venture project, uh, converting sewage treatment plants. So working with a bunch of electrical contractors, uh, doing a waste to energy project, converting sewage treatment plants to um, basically produce enough energy to cover themselves and create some marketing opportunities for business localities. Also maybe solar or wind farms, depending on what's going on. And so if someone raised their hand from, um, from a municipality, 
Uh, so sewage treatment plant Alaska. And, and there, so a sewage treatment plant in Alaska raises their hand and says, I'm interested in a special report about waste to energy opportunities for sewage aged sewer treatment plants. And so they come up here. I would go and actually research the individual. Now, this this one in particular is talking about the water quality, the compost, uh, the different uh, partnerships with the local community, the ability to turn biogases into energies, turn biosolids into re reusable compost. This customer may already have the answers for that, but they're looking for something specific. So I would go ahead and take that individual who raised their hand, plus research all the other individuals involved with that particular company and start building out a profile and then start sending direct mail to those individuals. Because the probability of getting one of their decision makers to visit your website is pretty low. Uh, getting all of them to visit your website is, is basically nearly impossible. But if one of them contacts you and you research out the owner and the key decision makers and then you send the, the individual who requested information exactly what they asked for, uh, again, with that next action included, and then you send the other people uh, things for lead perspective, you could end up getting all of them requesting the same report. And then when they get in the elevator, they're like, or they see each other at lunch, they're like, hey, I just got this, this special report on waste to energy options. Uh, and it was very interesting on page five. They talked about such and such. And the other person says, you know what? I got that same report. And, and what was interesting is on page 12 is where they talked about how, how we're going to reduce our cost. See, every decision maker has a different interest. The comptroller will be looking at cost benefit analysis. The uh, technicians will be looking at ease of management and operations. You can cover all of that in the same special report. But you can also reach out to influencers who have different interests and re and get them involved. Again, it's the same special report. It's the same book. It's the same webinar. But now you're you're individually addressing people's concerns. And when you've got like three of five raising their hand, then you know you can invest a visit to the site. You could do an event in their locale. Um, and and that's how you sell these big high ticket deals. Uh, so when, when you hire me for services, my services start at like, and, and I know you guys on the phone already know, know this. It starts at like ten to twenty thousand dollars just to be engaged and to talk about the plan. But the reason the plan works so well is because of what I shared with you on this presentation today. It really is just three simple steps, and we are incrementally moving that prospect from not having your solution to your solution is the only possible choice that they could ever decide to use. Um, but we're not doing it all in one jump. It's like, me, you know, you're a young man and you're at a bar and you meet a young lady. You don't immediately want to get married. But you want to get to know the person a little bit. They want to get to know you a little bit. And then you you move along the, imp the interactions. The more interactions they have with you, the more likely they are to be qualified. So when we talk about behavior, so we're, we're down here at the behavior tab again. We're looking at behavior flow. We don't necessarily want people to buy on the second interaction if we have a complex service. But the second interaction is really good for like requesting more information, a white paper, a special report, to attend, attend a demonstration, to visit your booth. That's good for the second intera interaction. Really what's going to happen, and this is not going to happen on your website, is that fourth and fifth interaction, according to... Uh, it's been the same for thousands of years, I guess. Uh, like Tom Hopkins talks about it. Brian Tracy talks about it. It's usually about nine interactions before somebody buys from you. Uh, so when I was out selling, I had to interact with somebody six to, to nine times before they were going to buy. And they were going to buy, no questions asked. All the decision makers were lined up. Everything was in straight. So that capturing the email address is really just the first step. But if you're not capturing an email address or, or compelling enough to get the email, you're not going to get their postal address. But a lot of times, if you get their email address, there are services out there that can append the rest of the information. If you get their postal address, I can definitely show you services to append the postal information. Anyway, we're, we're going to wrap this up right now. If you have more questions, I will be happy to go over the details in a recording, which we will then share uh, with everybody on the call here. So, of course, if you've attended this call, 
we definitely want to make sure that you get additional information and resources to make sure all your questions are answered. Uh, I, I like the monkey counting money. This is how easy it is. But you can really optimize your business website using five simple steps. As long as you understand the key most important element of your website is to generate leads and initial sales to produce customers. Customers are ultimately the equity of your business. And without profitable customers, you don't really have a business. And if you're tired of spending money on your website or spending money on a marketing campaign, or just spending money in general, and you really don't feel like anything's happening, well, you don't have to be a marketing victim. You can use these five simple steps to drive down any marketing medium. These five simple steps will optimize your website. They'll produce more leads. They'll generate more sales. And again, if you have any questions about these five simple steps, reach out to me. And uh, I like the monkey business. Uh, reach out to me and I'll answer your questions. You're going to send a fax to my office. You're going to uh, send us a, an email or use that little chat option. Uh, but don't call the office unless you're a client. Uh, we have a lot of client work going on now. The coronavirus, I know it's been a huge shutdown, but there's funding being made available. There are customers that are having problems that you need to be out there solving. And this is a huge time to get together. Don't cut your marketing. Don't step back from what you're doing. Just let's do it smarter so we can get to the bottom line result your customer's looking for and do that with profitable customers so you can get to the bottom line result that you're looking for. Again, I'm Justin Hitt with Ad Briefings Copywriting Tips. I got a couple other newsletters. I'm here to help you create and keep profitable customers and transform every business relationship into profits guaranteed. Thanks for attending.